Good morning, church. Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Before we get going this morning, uh, just a couple of things to remind you of that are coming up in addition to our normal uh, ministry events. Uh, this coming Friday at 6 p.m. at Charlie's Franklin uh, Men's Fellowship Dinner. We've had you know, several of these as a church body, so any of the men who want to come out and be a part of that, uh, it's always good fellowship, good food, a good time of just being together and encouraging each other. So that'll be uh, this Friday at 6 at Charlie's, right on Highway 96 in Franklin. Also, February 28th, as we announced last week, uh, for the preteen girls, um, at 6.15 p.m., uh, there's going to be an event at Franklin Lanes, uh, bowling and dinner. It's on the church. Uh, Tara Oslin, I think most of y'all know Tara and Justin. They head up our youth group here. But uh, Tara is going to head this up and uh, just meet with the girls and encourage them and kind of lead them and teach them. Um, during that event, it's going to happen on a regular basis. Uh, but as I said, this particular event, uh, February 28th, uh, so men just be aware of that. It's coming up in a few weeks uh, on March 4th. And again, as we mentioned last week, uh, we'll be planning a baptism service um, coming up in early spring. Uh, so just uh, be aware of that. If you have received the Lord and repented and you're walking with Him, but you've never been baptized and you would like to make that public demonstration of your faith, it would be a wonderful time to do it. Uh, it was a beautiful experience last year. And some people who were baptized who planned on being baptized that day, and some people were baptized who didn't plan on being baptized. That <laughs> so that's how God works. It was a beautiful thing to see. Um, and finally, before we worship, I just wanted to let all y'all know, you may have been following, but we had a wonderful, successful three days in Ukraine, and uh, pending any legal appeal, which uh, we don't anticipate any problem, uh, Angela will be fully our daughter. We're going to leave next Sunday for our final trip to Bay Hall. Uh, so, thank you all for that, for your prayers, um, and for your faithfulness in helping. And this has truly been a, a family effort, both our extended family and church friends. Thank you so much. And we will have, um, we'll have some, some video and some slides and a little presentation to share when we get back. There's so many things that uh, I want to let you all know about once she gets here that uh, we're just so evident of the Lord moving and really going before us in this process. So thank you again for your prayers and for all that you've done for us. But again, uh, before we worship, I want to ask you to stand with me. Open your Bibles to Psalm 89. Okay, we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. Now let's read together uh, verses 1 through 8 in Psalm 89. Let's so move to a time of worship. Reading from the New King James, Psalm 89. Beginning in verse number 1. The psalm says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever. And build up your throne to all generations. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Let's pray. Lord, indeed, who is like you? Who is mighty like you, and who can do the things that you do, Lord? Lord, we just stand in praise and wonder in awe of you this morning. We thank you that your love goes on forever. Lord, the heavens will indeed praise your wonders, and you are faithful. Lord, we're thankful for the promises that you make, the way you go before us in our lives, the way you clear paths for us, the way you unfailingly love us. 
For truly you are great. There is none like you. And Lord, this morning, I just want our praise to be focused on you. Our thoughts and our hearts to be focused on you. I want this time to be uh, honoring to you, Father. I want to just fully surrender ourselves and lift your name high. Lord, thank you again for bringing us together this morning. Be with those who couldn't be here and are traveling. Lord, just thank you again for this time. It's all for you. Lord, we love you. We again just move into a time now of praising you and giving you glory. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Well, please stay standing with us for worship. As Brian mentioned, uh, the projector is having some issues. It looks like the light bulb has burned out. So we had some slides for you, um, but we have no way to show them to you. So hopefully you'll know most of these songs. They'll be familiar. If you do know it, sing out extra loud so that uh, everybody can hear. It's called, this one you know. It's called How Great Thou Art. Yeah, this one. So, oh Lord, my
lift you up this morning, Lord. It's all about you, and we just praise you and love you and thank you and give you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. This was a new one last week. And we really did anticipate having some slides. <laughs> Savior, I come, quiet 
galaxies and the planets and the stars and everything is just our minds can't even begin to get around that and on the scale of this massive creation that we can't even understand on this 
tiny little speck in the corner of some insignificant galaxy on some planet around some mediocre sun that you came for us and that you loved us, each of us. Lord, and that you provide a way for us to be with you eternally. That death in the grave is not the end. But it's our chance to see you face to face and to be in your arms for eternity. Lord, just to ponder that and to contemplate that is so inspiring, Lord. And that you didn't have to do that, Lord, but that you loved us, that you gave your son for us. And we thank you and we praise you now. It's just such, it's so inspiring to think of a love that awesome, that strong. Thank you. 
So um, I'll tell you what, uh, we are continuing in our study in 2 Timothy, making our way through the New Testament, and uh, this morning we will pick up in chapter 2, starting in verse 8, and that again is in 2 Timothy. Does anybody need a Bible? If you need one, we'd love to bring one to you. Steve is ready to go. Looks like everybody is ready. All right, well, praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and again, we'll be in chapter 2, and we'll be starting in verse 8. I'm just going to read a couple of passages here just to get us started. But we will finish the chapter this morning, going through verse 26. Now Paul writes here to Timothy, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal Glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, 
will also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If, he is, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Father, we thank you, Lord, as we begin to look at this passage this morning. Uh, we come with anticipation. We know that, uh, Father, this is going to fall woefully short if it simply becomes an academic exercise. But Lord, we desire for your Holy Spirit to meet with us. Help us to understand what the Word says, that we might invite it to do its work in our hearts. We know, Lord, you promised that your Word will not return void, but it will accomplish that, which, that purpose which you set it forth to do. And we pray that here in this place, our hearts would be ready and open to hear what you'd say. And Father, we love you and our desire is to honor you with our lives and to walk with you with understanding that we might glorify your name. So bless the teaching this morning. I pray that you would bless your servant who, again, is woefully lacking, but by the power of your Holy Spirit, we know we can leave this place knowing you better than we did when we came in. So we thank you, Father. We ask you to bless this time and your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, once again, as we've said before, this, uh, this letter is written by a very seasoned pastor, evangelist, church planter, missionary, uh, to a much younger man and a relatively unseasoned pastor by comparison. Uh, Timothy is a younger man. He's younger than Paul. He doesn't have quite the experience that Paul had. And, and Paul, who you know, basically started up this church that Timothy is now pastoring in Ephesus, uh, Timothy has big shoes to fill. You know, it's, uh, it's funny. I used to once in a while fill in for our old pastor, Pastor Phil, in Chicago. And, uh, and I'll tell you, it, it never went away, but especially in the earlier opportunities that came up. Uh, you know, this is, that, that was a church that was just understood the word. They knew the word. He taught them so well, and continues to teach them so well, that any time any of us as assistant pastors would stand in the pulpit, we felt like we were like a lion in the den of Daniels, if you've heard the expression. And, uh, and so, you know, you think about it, and that was just filling in once in a while. But Timothy now has taken charge to stand this post. And so he's, he's no doubt willing and ready to receive any insight that Paul might share with him, that he might accomplish his purpose and task, that he might fulfill his calling uh, to the best of his ability. And so Paul, knowing this, I believe, uh, would be sharing with him these things that he considers to be most important to Timothy as this pastor standing in this position and role of leading this fellowship into a deeper relationship with Christ and sharing the gospel, uh, both in word and in deed, to the world outside. And so Paul is writing this to a, to a pastor. And again, we have mentioned before, and I want to just reiterate again this morning, especially too, as we continue, that the context of this letter is from one pastor to another. Okay, it's not really written to the church by and large. It's written to Timothy. Okay, it's not necessarily for his eyes only, but he's the focus. That said, I think that every one of us, person and person alike, can glean from this field and learn some things that are going to help us walk in our relationship with Christ in a way that honors him and blesses him and stands as a testimony to the outside. But that said, uh, don't be surprised if a few things here I'm going to, I'm going to speak to uh, in regard to the context that it was originally written in. But again, my, my desire is that we not just learn some stuff about how one pastor would teach another, but that we do take with us things that we can uh, that we can digest really and just apply to our own lives so but again i don't want to forget the context of this now paul here again as we begin our passage remember that jesus christ of the seed of david was raised from the dead according to my gospel uh, according to my gospel paul is not saying that he has some different kind of a gospel than the gospel he is simply saying the gospel that he has connected himself to the one that he is proclaiming which is in fact the gospel it's not a different one it's the same one. It's the gospel of Christ fulfilled at the cross and in the resurrection uh, and everything that that entails. Okay, he's saying my gospel because to him it is very personal. It's not simply a message that he's coming as if he's some unwitting, uh, you know, uh, delivery guy just bringing a message and then leaving. No, he's personally invested in, in this message and making sure that it is shared uh, rightly, effectively, powerfully with those who will hear it. It's what his life is based on and rooted in. It's what he suffers for and endures hardship for. It's the gospel. There is one gospel that we all are saved by, and that's the one he's referring to. Now, in, uh, in uh, verse 8, as much with Romans 1, 3, are seen as possibly part of a confession of the early church. Again, Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. Okay? Not just that he died. Not just that he went to the cross, but that he also rose again. We've mentioned many times in the past, and if you're with us for our Engage series, you made a point of 
mention the fact that the gospel is not just the fact that Jesus died for your sins. He also rose again. That's how we know that his offering was accepted. That's why he, we know he was God, because sin could not hold him down. He was free of sin himself. He took our sin upon himself, but he rose from the dead. He conquered death, and therefore it no longer has any sting. But notice here as well, Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Two things I would point out just from that simple, uh, again, what possibly may have been a confession here early on in the church's history. First off, this gospel was laid out prophetically of the seed of David. Okay, it goes back to something. Now, when you read the genealogies of Christ, we understand that, that, that his, his birth line goes through the seed of David. Okay, matter of fact, let's turn for just a moment to 2 Samuel. We're going to go way back into the Old Testament for a moment. 2 Samuel in chapter 7. I asked you all if you needed a Bible. 2 Samuel, uh, first, I'm sorry, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, David has, at this point, recognized a great disparity in his mind. Uh, he is dwelling in a palace of cedar, a wonderful home that is fit for a king, but he recognizes that his home is greater looking in appearance than the house of God. Because at this point, the temple has not been built. There is still the tabernacle that followed them through the wilderness and has now been set up as a place of worship here in, uh, in the city of David. And he's got this palace here that, that is his home. And he looks out the window, he sees this tent, and he says to himself, why on earth am I living in such a wonderful place while God is living in the tent? And so he takes it upon himself to want to build a house for God. And he tells Nathan the prophet, his friend, about this. And Nathan says, David, go for it, man. Do all that is in your heart. And... God speaks to Nathan and says, you've spoken a little too presumptuously, Nathan. Go back to David and let him know that there's too much blood on his hands, and therefore he will not be the one to build my house. Nevertheless, he will provide, you know, David will end up providing all this stuff for the house so, temple, so Solomon can build the temple. But David says, you will not build, or God says to David, you will not build me a house, but I will build you a house. And this is where we come into 2 Samuel chapter 7, looking starting in verse 12. Notice here what the Lord has to say. When your days are fulfilled... And you rest with your fathers. I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Okay, David, you can't build me a house. You're not the one I picked to do that. Your son Solomon will do that. Nevertheless, I will build you a house. Now, later on, again, as we find out the birth of Christ has come upon us, that that line of, of Jesus has gone through the line of David. There is prophecy involved. In his birth. As a matter of fact, that prophecy does not start, of course, with uh, the words that God spoke to David, but they go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when God refers to the seed of the woman who will one day crush the head of Satan. Okay, this is the Savior that will one day come and set things right. His coming was prophesied, it was laid out prophetically. Again, in Luke chapter 1, we also know where the angel tells Mary that he will sit on the throne of his father David. Forever. So again, it was laid out prophetically, but Paul also goes on to make the point that it was fulfilled publicly. The birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ was lived out in front of even the harshest critics. What Paul says here was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He is challenging the outside world on that claim. Now, without going into the, everything that can be brought to bear on that point, when you claim that the one you believe in is someone who is dead but is alive again, that Harvard, that's going to bring a response. There will be those that will believe you, and there will be those that will harshly criticize that claim and challenge you on it. And that's not a bad thing. But Paul is so sure of it, because why? He saw Jesus alive. He's not just simply sharing what others have told him. Now, all of us do that. We look at the testimony and all this kind of thing. But Paul was there. He saw Jesus alive after he had been crucified. And that's why he can share with such passion, because he's absolutely certain of that which has been done, which has been accomplished in Christ. Paul himself had this encounter with Jesus, and so he says, he is the, the seed of, the, uh, of David, he is also raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Now, Paul, is, it's no secret to us, we've talked about this, you know, many times, but Paul is no stranger to suffering for the cause of Christ. 
endure tremendous suffering in, in God's service. Now, currently, uh, we've spoken of this already, but I'll just reiterate. Paul is in his second imprisonment in Rome. He is, uh, this is not his first imprisonment. He's going to die, as uh, ultimately, uh, after this imprisonment. His days are numbered. And so he's a man who's currently enduring hardship. Uh, he's not having necessarily a, a tremendously easy go of it, but he is, he's suffering for the Lord. Um, it's important for us to remember, and, and we won't spend a lot of time because, we, we again, we, we mention this whenever it comes up, but following Jesus does come at a cost, right? I mean, we understand that if we're going to claim the name of Christ, there will come with it sometimes opposition, persecution, hardship. Uh, you know, Paul will again, he'll say uh, later on, he'll say, you know, the, all who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, that's, you know, he doesn't seem to leave a lot of exception with that. If you're walking with Jesus, if you're living for Christ, then you're going to be consistent with that. There will be a response to that. Okay, now Peter makes a distinction in, in his writings where he talks about those who, you know, if you suffer hardship because of your own doing, that's one thing. You know, if you're going to be kind of obnoxious about it and people get on your case about it, that's not really suffering for Jesus. You kind of brought that on yourself. But when you suffer for Jesus' sake, it's a worthy thing. It's a good thing. It's something that you should not shun, but you should embrace. You should recognize the value of such a thing. Peter himself uh, would consider it a blessing to be counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Now, Paul had not brought this upon himself, but instead he was an ambassador in chains for Christ. And he endures it both for the sake of the cross, but also, he says here, for the sake of the elect. Notice again here. Uh, uh, in verse 10, but I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they who uh, they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, for with eternal glory. Paul's desire here is to be an example and a testimony, not only for the sake of the glory of God, but also for the sake of salvation of those who will hear that message and see his testimony. Those who are elect may speak of those who are maybe not Christians yet, but will come, or may just simply speak of his testimony before the church as far as their, uh, his desire to see them walk with him uh, with intention and determination. But he lives this out in front of the world to see for those who will be saved and those ultimately uh, who are saved and can be encouraged by such a thing. But notice here, he talks about how he is in chains. He's suffering hardship for the sake of the cross. He says, while he is in chains, the word of God is not chained. Okay? And that is all that matters to him. And by extension, Timothy, this is what should ultimately matter to you. Whatever you have to endure as a good soldier of Christ, recognize that whatever comes upon you and seems to hold you down, the gospel itself, the word of God itself, is not chained. No matter what obstacle, no matter what kind of chains the devil himself may seek to put on God's truth, it will never be chained. Now, I've said many times, I'm, I'm into apologetics, I'm into arguments and debates and stuff, but sometimes those of us who are into that kind of thing can feel like it's our arguments that allow the Word of God to flourish when we share it. Uh-uh. It's been well said that the Word of God is like a lion. All you need to do is let it out of the cage. Okay, those whose hearts will be changed and challenged and transformed by it will be changed and challenged and transformed by it, regardless of who the delivery person is. Okay, God's Word will not be changed. It will go forth regardless of the barriers that Satan attempts to erect. As a matter of fact, it even flourishes. It even flourishes. I would even say, and I don't think it's too off base to say this, I don't think it's at all off base to say this, it is oftentimes when the church has been persecuted for its belief in the word of God, it is during those times that the church ultimately becomes most healthy and most potent. Okay? Remember the first century. Christianity was not accepted. It was not seen as a valid religion. It was seen as a cult by the Jews. And because they would not bow their knee to Caesar as well as Jesus, it was an outlawed religion in the Roman Empire. Okay. Nevertheless, when we read the book of Acts, we hear the testimony of the early church. They have even come here and turned the world upside down with their doctrine. Does that sound like a group of people that are being you know, shut down because they're being in chains or they're being pushed underground or whatever? No. The word of God will not be chained. It will not be chained. The church in China in modern times is a great example of this. We thought when, you know, whether it was in China or even in Russia, when, when communism would take over or when there would be oppression of the church in any form, there's a sense that the church, when it goes underground, what, what happens? Christianity is going to die out in this land. When missionaries finally go back into some of these places, they find that the church is flourishing. There's a purity about the people of Christ because they know this is all they have. And they have poured themselves entirely into the purpose of following him and believing him and trusting him 
and walking with him. We support far-reaching ministries here. Some of you remember Edward uh, Amaya having come out and shared with us. Well, these, these chaplains that go out into Sudan and South Sudan and go alongside of those who are fighting, and they, they, they literally run out into the middle of fields as men are shot to share the gospel with them, to make sure that before they take their last breath in time and step into eternity, that they have that opportunity to get right with God in Christ. And to hear the stories. Matter of fact, uh, uh, one of them even shared with us, you know, it's ultimately God who's in charge of the bullets. That's why when the enemies shoot at us and the bullets don't hit us, it's because God's the one who's in charge of the bullets. You know, they believe him, they trust him, and they, they throw themselves literally in harm's way to fulfill the Great Commission. Missionaries and Gospel for Asia would fit this category, obviously, in many respects and many opportunities. Fox's Book of Martyrs, it was a, if you've never read this book, it's an extremely depressing one in some respects, but on the other hand, it's an extremely encouraging book as well, because it's, it's a history of so many that have given their lives for the cause of Christ, dying horrific kinds of deaths, starting with the apostles all the way through recently modern times. But one particular uh, uh, person, uh, which actually really is part of what's called the uh, uh, gosh, was it the Cambridge Three, I think, with Hugh Latimer and and uh, and uh, and, and uh, uh, Nicholas Ridley. They're being burned at the stake for their faith. Listen to what Latimer has to say to his partner at the stake while being burned at the stake with his fellow fellow early reformer Nicholas Ridley. He's reported to have said, "Play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out." while they are burning at the stake. Countless stories, men singing songs, and men and women alike being, being burned, crucified, dragged by horses, beaten to death, all these horrific kinds of things because they believe in, in, in what they're saying. They have completely committed themselves to him in whom they trust. This is the kind of motivation that Paul has. It doesn't matter what happens. As long as the gospel is unchained, he doesn't mind himself being in chains. It's a tremendous encouragement to a young pastor at that time, who no doubt expected to have to face persecution for the sake of the cross. But he endures all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He goes on to say what many have considered to be an early hymn of the church in verses 11 to 13. This is a faithful saying. For if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Again, this may have been an early hymn in the church that he's uh, recounting here as he's teaching Timothy. But let's look at it for just a moment. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. Now, the Christian life is rooted on the fact that we are to take up our cross and follow after Jesus. Is it not? That does not mean that if you have a burden in your life, that's your cross to bear. That's not what that means. It's not nearly as light as that. To take your cross and follow Jesus, to take up your cross and follow Jesus, for me to take up my cross and follow Jesus, does not simply mean that sometimes there's hard things you got to deal with, and that's your cross to bear. A hard job, a wayward child. These are hard things, but that's not really the fullness of what's being said. To take up your cross implies that you, like Jesus, are going to die. Okay? Crucifying self means the old man is dead. It's over. Michael mentioned this morning we're going to have, uh, plan a baptism service. By the way, we do have somebody that wants to be baptized. Anybody else, just let us know that. But in a baptism service, what we're doing, when we immerse somebody in water, we put them down under the water and bring them back up. That symbolizes the putting to death of the old self. It's gone. It's dead and buried. There are times when people will be there and they'll say to hold me down a little bit. There's a lot to bury. <laughs> down down with the old, and then rising to new life as you come out of the water. That's why we practice immersion, because there's a picture there that needs to be shown. And that's exactly what the Christian life is. It's goodbye to the old self. No longer am I going to be that person anymore. I'm, I'm availing myself to the Lord for him to change me from the inside out and make me a new creation in Christ. Okay? If we die with him, we will also live with him. He goes on. If we endure... We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we endure, if we endure. The question, of course, the Calvinists look at this, and, 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 and Calvin did make something very, very, I think, very insightful on this subject. He said, what is, what is the evidence of the perseverance of the saints, but that, in fact, the saints do persevere? Okay? 
I think that's very insightful, and I agree with that statement. The idea here that you are a believer in Christ to the end. Now, can we backslide? Yes. Can we have moments of doubt? Yes. But if you belong to him, you belong to him. Okay, now, I'll, I'll, let me quote John here from his first epistle, 1 John chapter 2. He says, little children, it is the last hour, and as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. And listen, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Okay, now that's a lot of insight right there. How do you know that somebody is in fact a believer, but that they do in fact endure to the end? Okay, they're standing with the Lord in that day. Are all believers dying in a, in a place of faithful walking with the Lord? Not necessarily, no. But when Jesus said, no one snatches them out of my hand or my Father's hand, I think he meant that. Uh, again, I, if, if you disagree with the idea of eternal security, then you are free to do that. I'm not going to get up in your face about it. I don't. I do believe in eternal security. I do think that once you are a believer in Christ, he has you. You're his. The evidence of your not being his is shown by the fact that you, that you cease to walk with him. Now, of course, there's a lot more nuance to that. I don't mean to be simplistic about it. And no doubt somebody will take me to task on this after church, and that's fine. We just have different views on that. But when Paul talks about enduring, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. The idea here that we will continue to walk with him, and one day we will also reign with him, even as the scriptures say. But notice here, if we deny him, he will also deny us. And connected with that is verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now, deny him in, a, in, a, uh, in an ultimate kind of sense. How do I know that? Remember Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times, even though Jesus told him he was going to deny him. And Peter, in a classic answer of self-reliance, said, Surely I will not do this, Lord. They might. But I won't. Peter, you know, that's, that's you know, he'll, he'll say no, Lord, to Jesus again later on. But when God says something, when the Lord tells you something, yes. Okay, it's not no, it can never happen. No, he knows what's in us. Well, Peter responds and says, I'll never deny you. I will never deny you. Servant girl in a fire, you know, you know him. Yeah. Three times. Jesus makes it a point to restore Peter personally, okay? It's not that you have a moment of doubt or in a time of frustration in the midst of a hard trial that you cry out at God and say, I just, I cannot trust you anymore or some kind of thing like that where you just, you're just at your wit's end over something. That is wrong. That's not really okay. But know this, Psalm 103 tells us God knows our frame that we are dust. He understands our failings and our frailties. Nevertheless, I think Peter's example stands as a reason for us to look at it and say, in my moment of failure, Jesus still loves me enough to come after me. Tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is alive, the angel says. When they're on the shore and they're walking back, they, they don't even recognize him, if not for the fact that he told them to, to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. Peter, then realizing it's the Lord, jumps out and swims to shore and everything. And, and as they're walking, Peter, you know, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? A second time. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? The third time. I'm sure at this point, Peter realizes I have denied him three times and he is asking me this third time. There's a parallel there. Do you love me? And I believe at this point, Peter was broken. Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Jesus makes it a point to restore him, even though it's a colossal failure. A colossal denial, the most epoch-ringing denial in all of history, much let alone Christendom. But Jesus restores him. Why? Because we are all capable of denying him in some context, under some circumstances. We might crack. We might break. That's not what Paul is talking about. If we deny him, if we reject him, if we will not believe him, okay? Now, again, that's connected with verse 13 here. And I, I used to hold this particular view, but I have to admit, after looking into it a little bit more deeply and understanding the Greek a little bit better, uh, I have a differing view, and it tends, I, I find out, to be the much more prevalent view. Some have seen in verse 13 that this is really a reference. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. Well, some, some, including, again, myself in the past, have seen this as a reference really to God's faithfulness in our times of failure. 
But the Greek does not really apply that. It implies something stronger. And it's connected with verse 12, the second half of verse 12. It speaks much more to the idea that God, in keeping with his nature, will deny knowing us if we are, in fact, faithless, without saving faith. And that idea of without faith speaks of refusal to believe in him. Okay? So even though he loves you, even though he died on a cross for every lost sinner that has ever lived, including everyone in this room and everybody outside, even though his love burns hot for everybody who has ever lived, if you reject him, he cannot break the, the virtue of his nature by looking that over and just saying, okay, you're fine anyway. If we deny him, if we are faithless, if we do not have, if we refuse to believe in him, he cannot deny himself. Okay, he will refuse you and reject you. It's a very, very solemn warning. It's not intended to make us feel good. It's intended to make us understand the gravity and the weight of rejecting him. And there are those who do. And that's a tragedy. There are those that will hear the gospel many, many times in their life. They'll find themselves in a circumstance that God has orchestrated specifically so that they will come, but they will reject him. And it's not that he doesn't know that, but nobody will ever be with, 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 with an excuse to say, well, God never gave me enough reason, or God never tried to meet with me. No. No. He loves us too much to let that happen. But nevertheless, there is a point that we can cross, and if we deny him, he will ultimately deny us as well. Now, Paul goes on in verse 14 and says, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers, but be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like a cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Okay? Now, in light of the weight of what Paul has just said, he goes on to say, remind them. Remind the people under you. Remind other teachers that you are going to train and bring up to know. The men that you will appoint to leadership that will then go on to appoint others. Remind them of these things. And also remind them not to strive about the word, about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. But be diligent yourself to be approved to God. It does not need to be ashamed. A worker who rightly divides the word of truth. Again, 16, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase more ungodliness. The idea of sound words versus vain words or vain babblings is what, is what Paul begins to move into as he describes his, or as he commissions Timothy and encourages him in his ministry. First off, this idea of words of no profit. No profit means useless, profitless. They are absolutely of no use whatsoever. People get wrapped up in these kinds of things. You know, I mean, there, there are some things that are so ridiculously stupid. You know, can God make a rock so big that he himself cannot lift it? Come on. Seriously. You know, then there are others that, that just, you know, they, they want to find every theological argument they can find and just hang on these things and debate everybody they can about it just simply because they love to argue and they want to make people know they're right about something. Even if you're right, I still don't want to know you. I mean, you're annoying. I mean, just seriously, that's all you want to do is fight and argue about stuff. Some stuff's worth fighting and arguing about. Some stuff is just a waste of time. It is profitless. You know, you can talk about, uh, we've mentioned Calvinism already, you can talk about uh, once saved, always saved, or not. You can talk about uh, whether or not, you know, the five, six, or even, believe it or not, 21 points of Calvinism are right or not. You can argue these things, and they, it can be either a fruitful conversation for the sake of understanding theology a little better, or it can be an utter waste of time because it's nothing more than an argument and a yelling back and forth and simply trying to prove you're right. Okay? Don't get wrapped up in things, Paul says to Timothy. You especially as a pastor, Timothy, and others who you will bring up under you, do not get wrapped up in these things. They are profitless. As a matter of fact, goes on. It's not just that they're of no profit, but they ultimately bring ruin to the hearers. That word ruin is where we get our word catastrophe from. Catastrophe from. Okay, it's intended to let us know that, look, this will bring, it'll, it'll utterly destroy your walk. It'll, it'll keep you up in things that are not of any profit. It'll slow you down. It'll tear you down. It'll bring catastrophe to your life if this is all that it's going to be about. He calls them profane, idle babblings, which speak of them being worldly or godless or foolish. 
These are things that fuel further ungodliness, Paul says, and therefore have nothing to do with them. He gave a similar warning in 1 Timothy. He's reiterating it here. You know, it's like the, uh, the pastor who, or the theology student, the, the divinity student that wanted his degree, but he, he debated the virgin birth because only two gospels mention it. And, uh, and so, you know, one of, the, one of the professors that was either going to pass or fail him asked him, well, you know, how many times does God have to say something? You know, if he says it twice, it must be important. Verily. Then there's verily, verily. Right? I mean, it's important or it's really important. Well, Paul is now reiterating a second time not to get wrapped up in this kind of stuff. We ought not get wrapped up in this kind of stuff. It's good to have a good, again, I, I'm beating to death. I'm not saying don't ever discuss them, but if it's for the sake of just making yourself seem smart or right or you're, you're wasting everybody's time, including your own, and you might even ultimately find yourself so wrapped up in these kinds of things that you can experience a real measure of ruin in your Christian life. Now, by contrast, verse 15, and this is a great one to memorize, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God's word of truth in direct and total contradistinction from profitless, vain babblings, okay? Opposite ends of the spectrum in every possible way. You can waste your time on this other stuff, but you, Timothy, do not do that. Instead, be diligent. Exert yourself. Give diligence. Pour yourself into. Put the most intentional effort into presenting yourself literally as one who is approved or up to snuff, one who's passed the test to God, one who's tried by fire and found still standing, you know, a storm blows through the forest. What's the strongest tree in the forest? The one that's still standing, right? That's how you know. Timothy, be that tree. Be like that. When you're tested, you're pushed, you're bent, you're, the fire comes to, to, to test and refine you, be the one who has shown approved, the one who is standing after that test. This is what Paul is driving Timothy to do. Why? Because the weight of the message he has to share is worthy of whatever it takes to share it and share it right. And therefore, don't get wrapped up with things that will distract you from that single laser beam focus that God has called you to pour yourself into. Okay? It's expressive kind of language. The idea here is that Timothy needs to recognize the value and therefore uh, pour into the perseverance necessary to make sure that he holds God's word of truth right. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, right now <coughs> divining. Now, this idea of not ashamed means that after having been inspected, having been scrutinized and looked at, he does not need to be ashamed. There's no flaw. There's no fault uh, there that can be pointed out where God is saying, sorry, you are disqualified. No. You've stood. I've tested you. I've refined you. You are, in fact, one who can stand. Not ashamed under scrutiny or under inspection. And this approval, again, is based on faithfulness to God's word and rightly dividing God's word. Rightly dividing means to cut straight and to expound soundly, uh, as opposed to wrongly dividing, obviously. Rightly dividing God's truth as opposed to wrongly dividing God's truth. That doesn't mean that someone who may be a Bible teacher for decades can't learn something that changes their view on something. However, the practice of their life is to be thoroughly studied in what they're teaching so that when they do teach it, they're teaching it correctly. Okay? This is what the call on Timothy is going to be in those he will train, and certainly any pastor even today. This is why James says in chapter 3, verse 1, that there is a stricter judgment upon teachers. Therefore, don't seek to be teachers. Unless God has called you, don't try to be something that God has called you to be in regard to being a teacher of God's word. Why? Because there's a stricter judgment. You are held to a higher standard because you're teaching God's word. I, again, we've made the, the kind of the joke kind of comparison. It's not like you're in a book club discussing different ideas and, and uh, anybody, especially in our postmodern world, can read into anything that the author might have meant, whatever they think he meant. No, when it comes to the scripture, there is no such nonsense brought to bear. God means what he says, and he says what he means, and if you're going to share it, know it, understand it, share it rightly, teach it thoroughly, cut straight the word of God. This is what, his, what ultimately he's being judged on, and, and frankly, any of us who are pastors are being judged on. Faithfulness to God's word, and ultimately rightly dividing it. There's an eternal weight inherent in this word that we wield from the pulpit, and therefore we need to take it seriously. Now this word, again, stands in distinction as profitable to all of the unprofitable ramblings that can be taught or ultimately caught up with, uh, people can be caught up with as they teach. And Paul goes on here, even as he did last time, to name a couple of folks that are into this kind of thing. Verse 16 again, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread 
like cancer. Okay, that's a pretty vivid description. And by the way, the word cancer there literally is gangrene. Okay, it will spread like gangrene. It will rot everything it comes in contact with. These idle, profane babblings. This message that is rooted in nothing but unprofitable words will ultimately spread like cancer. Why does it spread like cancer? We could easily say, well, it's because some people just want to spend all their time teaching and propagating these ideas, but it's also because people receive it. Look, I, you know, uh, some of you will relate to me, some of you will come to me with things, some of you already have come to me with things. I'm not the healthiest eater you're ever going to meet. <laughs> I don't know if you know that or not. Um, you know, I love oftentimes what shows up on the snack table after church. Sometimes I, I just have my coffee. And, uh, you know, the rest of you love it. You love the strawberries and the kiwis and all the fruits and all that kind of stuff. I'm all about the donuts and the cheese and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I freely admit that, you know. And, uh, but, you know, the truth is, and, and, you know, I would say, well, I'm not stupid, but apparently I am. Because there are a lot of things that are out there. A lot of people write articles and there are doctors that give you clear understanding. They say, look, it's as if they would say, Bri, if you continue eating the way you are, you're going to die. You're an idiot. Don't eat that way. But I do it anyway. Okay? There are things that are taught from pulpits and churches around the world that are ridiculous and stupid, but people receive them. Okay? It's not just that it's out there. I don't have to go eat the donuts and the cheese and all the stuff on the table, but I go there and I get it and I willingly put it inside of myself, not really worried about what it's going to cost me later, until later comes. In a spiritual sense, if you take this stuff into yourself and you receive it and you allow it to sort of be what you're feeding on spiritually, it's eventually going to wipe you out. It's going to make you weak. It's going to make you anemic. It's going to make you emaciated spiritually. You're not going to have the strength to move. But people take it anyway. And it's partly because they're not discerning. It's partly because they like to have their ears tickled. It's partly because the other stuff sounds too cold and harsh and judgmental. Look, bro, you've already talked about hell today. We're only halfway through this thing. Sorry. But you know what? God said that. What good am I doing you if I just skip over the rough parts because they're uncomfortable? I mean, imagine going to a doctor's office if you had cancer. And he didn't want to bug you with that kind of thing because it's a real downer. Man, I, you know, no, you look great. Everything's fine, you know. Yeah, I know there's a little discoloration on the x-ray, but don't pay attention. Most of it's really white and clean. You know, that's what we want to focus on, the happy stuff. Well, what good would he be doing you? All of a sudden, six months later, you're in the hospital, and you're saying, why didn't you tell me this? One day, you know, and, and, and I know sometimes there are concepts that are hard to understand, and sometimes it's, 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 it does bristle against us, and it, whether it's against our pride or just the thought that, man, I don't know if I want to say these things to someone who's unsaved. But look, you know, let me just put it this way. I don't believe our call is to, is to just politely get out of the way as people make their way down the road left to destruction. I think at the very least, they ought to trip on us. At the very least. If we can't stop them outright, they ought to at least sense there's a bump in the road that makes them take pause. That's why we talk about this stuff. That's why we don't shy away from the stuff that's hard. That's why the stuff that's unpleasant uh, gets put on the plate. You know, and Julie will tell you this, I don't eat broccoli, I don't eat green beans. There's things I just cannot stomach. I can't put them down. But you know what? I need to eat salads and I need to eat stuff. Why? Because it's good for me. Right? And I do eat salad, by the way. I'm not totally chunky. But it's, you know, I eat some things that are okay. But... But the reason you do is because you know they're good for you. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll sit down and I'll have a Caesar salad. I won't always just push it to the side anymore. I'll eat them now. Uh, I'll eat some various vegetables and stuff. I'll try and shy away from other stuff that may not be so good for me all the time. Why? Because if you want to be healthy and you want to be strong, you've got to eat some stuff because it's good for you. Not all truth can be ice cream truth. Some truth is going to be broccoli truth. Some truth is going to be Caesar salad truth. Yeah, I'd rather have ice cream, but you know what? I need this stuff. And that's why we talk about it. And we'll continue to talk about it because we, we need it. It's, it's, it's there. We don't just skip it because it doesn't taste good. But here, Paul is letting us know there's a couple of guys going around there. And these, these, these people he mentions, Hymenaeus and Philetus, uh, these are just a couple of names of what is probably a larger group of false teachers that are out there. But they're just prominent among that group. And what are they doing? They're communicating cancer, spiritual cancer. And so Paul calls them on it. We said last week, we don't want to have the attitude where we're just looking for opportunities to call out people, but when someone is just plainly, flatly producing this kind of stuff, then yes, they should be named so that we can warn people to stay away. This is what Hymenaeus and Philetus 
were doing. These false teachings had the potential, and they were being propagated, even though they spread like spiritual cancer or gangrene. Now, what were they teaching? Well, we don't know exactly what they were teaching, except that they taught something related to the idea that the res resurrection had already passed. Uh, whether they were connecting this idea with Gnosticism, where there was not a physical res resurrection of the body coming, and thereby Jesus himself didn't physically resurrect, there's a couple of different ideas of what they might have been teaching. But in any case, Paul repudiated their doctrine by repudiating them. And he said that those who had taught these things, namely these guys, had strayed from the truth and also had overthrown the faith of some. Hymenaeus. This is the same Hymenaeus we see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. There he's mentioned with Alexander, who is also mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 4. These are the two guys that Paul delivered to Satan. Okay? Probably excommunicated them, kicked them out of the church, not for the sake of simply leaving them out of the church, but that they might recognize the error of their ways and repent and turn. Clearly they have not done this. And so therefore Paul does not mind mentioning them by name. The Hymenaeus and Alexander did not turn away. And Philetus, who we don't know anything about except that he's connected here, much like Phygelus and Hermogenes last time, he's mentioned only here, he's mentioned as a heretic. That's how he's known in history. Because he's teaching false doctrine and overthrowing other people's faith in Christ. Nevertheless, verse 19, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, uh, some have seen this, this, uh, these two phrases, the Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity is being taken in part from numbers uh, when Moses is speaking to the people and that kind of a thing. Uh, we don't know for sure if that is or not. But Paul makes a very good point here in making these two points. The Lord knows, first of all, those who are his. Okay? He goes, let me just actually read on just a little bit. In verse 20, he goes on to say, But a great house, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Okay? So again, God knows those who are his. That's the first part of verse 19. The rest of verse 19 and the rest of the chapter through verse 26 um, basically imply that if God knows who we are, so should the rest of the world if we're going to name the, the name of Christ. Okay? And I'm glad to give some practical explanations of, of, of what that looks like. But again, the Lord knows those who are his. He alone can see the heart. The idea of a seal would possibly have... Uh, possibly have evoked in their minds the idea of the Roman seal, that imprimatur that they would put on a, uh, on a tomb or something like that, or in any kind of a document that they would circulate. Um, you'd have the, you know, we've all seen in the movies and stuff, the wax there where they put the, the hot wax and they put this seal, this, uh, this peg with like an emblem on it, like a stamp, and they'd push it in there and they'd have the Roman seal on it. And what that basically meant was this letter was sent with, or this tomb was closed with, or whatever the case where the seal was on it, it was sent with or represented the full authority of Rome behind it. So don't break it under penalty of death or under penalty of whatever Rome decides to throw at you for breaking it. Now that may have been what was on their mind when you think this idea of a seal. But the seal that Paul is talking about is this simple fact. The Lord knows those who are his. Okay? That statement carries the weight of God behind it. He knows you. He knows your heart and he knows mine. He knows we belong to him. He knows if we don't belong to him. As a matter of fact, elsewhere in Scripture, uh, we see in Ephesians where the Holy Spirit is spoken of as our seal until the day of redemption. Okay? So God knows. As a matter of fact, even in, in Revelation, we see those that belong to the Lord in that day. That while the devil is putting this mark of the beast on the right hand or forehead, those 144,000 are sealed on their foreheads, aren't they? They're sealed with the Spirit of God as they go forth. He knows those who are his. Matter of fact, that we can go further and say he knows us intimately because he gives us a brand new name when we're in heaven. I'd love to know what that is. But there's this wonderful new name that he has given us. That's how much he knows us. Jesus says he knows us so well that he knows every intimate detail of our lives, including even how many hairs are on our head. That's how he knows us. The Lord knows those who are his. Okay? And he goes on then to say, uh, uh, and let everyone who names the name of Christ, uh, second half of verse 19, Depart from iniquity. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There's a, an allegiance built into that. The idea that if I'm going to be a Christian, then my life ought to be different. Now, I'm not going to tell you for a second that you are the one who changes everything about your life. You're the one who delivers yourself 
from drinking or drugs or smoking or sex, whatever it is that your addiction is. It's the Holy Spirit does that. But there is a decision on our part to throw ourselves on his mercy and to surrender our lives to him. Uh, if you don't know 1 Corinthians 10, 13, let's turn there. It's another great verse to underline, highlight, memorize, put up on your mirror on a sticky note. Chapter 10, verse 13. Paul again writing, it's the church in Corinth that was steeped in sin and compromise and really spiritual collapse in many ways. And for chapter 10, he says in verse 13 that uh, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay? In other words, yes, temptation will come. All of us are tempted. We may not all be tempted specifically in one arena the same way as everyone else, but the heart and core of that temptation is common to everybody. But God is faithful to not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Okay, what does that mean? Yes, the temptation is strong. Yes, the temptation is there, and I feel like it's overwhelming, and I cannot avoid it. God says that's not really true. He has not allowed you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And even when you are tempted, he gives you a way out so you don't have to fall to it. You can stand in the midst of it. Okay, now that, I don't say that to make anybody feel guilty because I know uh, that sometimes people struggle with things. We struggle with smoking, we struggle with uh, maybe someone struggling with pornography or something. Just something in there that just grabs our attention or just is part of us so much so that we cannot walk away from it. God is saying he will give you the strength to walk away from it. I don't say that to condemn you, but please do not feel hopeless. You're not. You're not. There are a lot of things in my life that I thought I would never be delivered from. But God did. He was faithful. And I'm not saying I'm squeaky clean in every area. I don't still have to fight the temptations when they come. But God has shown himself faithful, and I want to encourage you in that. So Paul says here, look, if you're in the name of the name of Christ, then depart from iniquity. Walk away from it. On the other side of the spectrum, from someone who is maybe, you know, from, from all, all, all uh, impressions when we first read about his story... Uh, the person of Lot in the Old Testament, when we read his story, here's a guy that we don't have any indication whatsoever that he's a believer. He's, in, he's, he's hanging out at the city gates in the worst places, a sin-infested place on earth. When the angels come, they want to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. they got to drag him out. Okay? It's not until Peter writes about Lot that we find out he was righteous. And whoever read that first was probably shocked. What? Righteous Lot? Those are two words I would never have thought to put together based on what I knew about Lot from the Old Testament. Probably none of us, and I don't mean to pick on Lot, but let, uh, probably none of us would want to have to wait till thousands of years after we live for anybody to know that we believed in God. Okay? That was the story of Lot, sadly. That's the testimony of Lot. Now, we've, Peter tells us that in his spirit he wrestled against these things at that time. You know, I, you wouldn't know it from reading the account, you know, but Peter says, no, this is a guy who, because he was righteous, did wrestle with these things. It's interesting. But God says, look, and then Paul, again, when the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, look, if you're going to claim Christ, depart from iniquity, walk away from it, don't be at the city gates uh, as one who may even be an authority in this place. Of course, we all know Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so Paul connects this idea of departing from iniquity and walking with the Lord as becoming <coughs> or being known as or even being used as a vessel of honor. Again, verse 20 and 21. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now, again, remember the context. Paul is writing to Timothy. It's not simply a generic thing, although we can all glean from this. Think of it in the context of, of one pastor to another. Timothy, God's call to you is to be a vessel of honor. Many have seen in this, Paul is comparing false teachers with true teachers. Okay? Timothy, the way that you're going to shine as a vessel fit for honor for the master's use is by being true to what God has said and not being a vessel of clay or wood, uh, as it were, but rather being a vessel of gold or silver. He may be speaking again in distinction between true and false teachers. Notice this in the house. Both vessels are there. Both are present. Both could be used by the master in some context or another, but the admonition is to be like a vessel of gold 
or silver. And again, the idea here may refer back to verse 15, where it talks about one who's, what can, can, uh, who's, who's able to stand after being tested. A vessel of gold and silver will stand, though the refining fires may burn. The vessels of clay and wood will not. They'll melt away and they'll burn away, and they will no longer be. Okay, and so I think the admonition is connected there, where Paul's saying, don't be like that. But again, show yourself approved. Be a vessel of gold, a vessel of silver. I should also point out here that within that, if that is in fact what Paul is saying, and I think it is, um, it gives us an indication of how people sometimes will view things differently than God. Um, there are plenty of vessels of wood and clay spewing out all kinds of doctrinal, I would never think I would do this, but I'll quote Paul Crouch, doctrinal doo-doo uh, <laughs> that's not worthy of hearing or emulating or speaking or preaching or conveying or receiving or living out, but it's still out there, okay? Um, the world might see those creatures as silver and gold. Maybe it's from the bling they're wearing when they're preaching. But it's the ones who are preaching truth that oftentimes are seen as the wood and the, the clay and that. But God sees it very differently. You know, oftentimes these preachers, you know, when you were a preacher in the New Testament, uh, you weren't wearing gold rings. You know, you weren't wearing fancy clothes. You weren't running around in fancy chariots and all this kind of thing. You weren't held in high regard or high esteem. You were oftentimes persecuted and even killed for your faith. You were somebody who oftentimes, like Paul in this circumstance, is virtually destitute in jail. Although he's the greatest evangelist and potentially greatest teacher, short of Jesus, that's ever lived in, in the history of the church. This is a guy who's got nothing. In fact, he's abandoned by most everybody he knows, except for a few people. The world would look at that and say, that's failure. The world would look at a Jeremiah and say, this is a guy that had no fruit in his ministry. All these years, and nobody listened to him. Uh, Jeremiah himself felt like a failure at times. But the world, no doubt, would look at that and say, well... Clearly, he had no real impact. But what will they do? They'll follow the fly-by-night people that wear all the jewelry because that's the sign of God's blessing. Look at them. They're rich. They're wealthy. They've got all the fancy cars and all the big houses and all this kind of thing. I actually heard one guy one time talking about, literally, on TV. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to sound cocky or arrogant about this. Forgive me if I'm coming off that way. But it just, you know, it does frustrate me to see what people are willing to buy into. But one particular... Uh, uh, televangelist was on TV uh, talking about how he wanted a yacht. The people ought to send him their money so he could get this yacht so he could go witness out on the lake to the other folks on the yachts. And he had no problem pushing that, laughing, just praising God about it. This is God's will. And, all this. and you know, I, I, I never followed up with him, you know, afterwards. I'm sure he got it, though. I'm sure people send him their money and did this. What? He's got a thousand dollar suit on. He's wearing eight hundred dollar loafers. He's God's clearly blessing him, right? You know, remember the disciples themselves fell into this. You know, I mean, here's, you know, Jesus said it's easier for a, you know, or a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man in the kingdom of heaven. They were shocked by this. They thought that riches were a sign of God's blessing. That's a common thought. He said, no, that's not how we see things. That's not the way God sees things at all. True riches are not measured by the wealth you have in your bank account or the ring on your finger. You know? If you have any ring on your finger at all, it ought to be a signet ring on the father whom you belong to. It's a sign of authority that's based on him. It's not the value of the ring itself. It's what it means. And, and oftentimes we confuse riches with meaning something it never meant to. Well, here he says, Timothy, be a vessel of gold and honor fit for your master's use. Fit for use means you're ready to be put into service. And when he sees, when he's getting ready to do something, he looks among those vessels that are sitting on the, in the cupboard, as it were, he reaches for you because you're ready. Okay, a vessel of clay and a vessel of wood, you wouldn't put out in front of people necessarily unless that's all you have. But if you have vessels of, uh, that, that look beautiful and pretty and all that, you're going to pull that out because you want to honor the people that you're with. That's who God's going to call out. He's going to call the one who is ready to be put into service. Timothy, be such a one. Be such a one. Verse 21, he goes on to say, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter... Uh, then he will be a vessel fit for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, latter being that which is dishonorable, he will be sanctified, set apart, consecrated for his purposes, considered to be of worth and value. That's what the idea of honor carries with it. Again, you're useful and you're ready to be put into service. 
Now, verses 22 through the rest speak about that in some practical ways. Notice what he says here as we finish the chapter. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, take flight from, run away from youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay, first off, take flight or flee from youthful lusts, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Uh, spiritual maturity underlies a vessel of honor in the body of Christ, okay? Not necessarily massive smarts or wonderful skill set or any of that kind of stuff. Maturity, okay? You may not be eloquent. You may not be super smart. You may not have wonderful skills in all these different areas of your life, but that doesn't in any way affect your ability to be mature in your walk with Christ, okay? And maturity involves knowing the difference, the value of following that which is good rather than running after that which is bad. When you're young as a child, even outside of the spiritual sense, your tendency is to run after shiny things or stuff that might taste good or whatever, but you're not mature enough to recognize that that may not provide for you everything you're thinking. Well, it may actually be damaging. But as you grow to maturity, you start to be able to discern or differentiate between that which is really valuable or that which will help you as opposed to that which will not. That's why Paul says that all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Okay, everything I can do whatever I want as a Christian. I can smoke, I can drink, I can do all these things if I really wanted to. But will it help me? If I'm going to walk in maturity and I have a choice, I'm going to choose something that will not bring me down, but will lift me up. And again, I'm setting aside you know bondages and stuff that we might be working through and praying through. If I have a choice of something, I'm going to grow hopefully to a place where I'll choose not to do those things uh, that will bring me down. Well, that's part of maturity. Flee from youthful lusts, those things that are worldly and fleshly, things that appeal to our, our fleshly nature, but rather pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. These are things that build us. These are values and traits that we want to not just know about, but we want to embrace. We'd love to be characterized by such things, and nobody is by accident. You know, when you think of virtuous people, there are reasons why you think of the people you do when words like that are employed. You know, if I mention, uh, you know, just in your mind, think of somebody who's the most honest person you know. Okay, there's a reason you thought of that person. They've demonstrated it over time. They've shown that over time. They've grown to a place where this is something that defines who they are. Who is someone who is the most loving or most peaceful or most faith-filled? One who walks in righteousness. This is what God calls us to be. This is what Paul is encouraging Timothy. Be this way. Flee from those things that would undermine that which will help you grow in maturity and walk with God. Again, verse 23 speaks again to this idea of foolish words. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Very straightforward. We want to avoid these things because, in fact, they tear down. They don't build up. They cause division rather than bring people together. Unfortunately, those kinds of arguments only bring together people that you really don't want to be connected with anyway. Uh, it's just, you know, sometimes people just, they're drawn to other people who like to argue just simply because they like to argue or they want to get caught up in something like we talked about before. Paul again reiterates again, don't be that way. Don't be that way. Avoid those kinds of things. Ignore disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they will know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So not only, Timothy, should you demonstrate these other qualities, but you also need to embrace the idea of walking in humility. Remember, he's a pastor, okay? There are general things we can learn, but recognize, Timothy, you as a person who will, as, as it were, stand uh, as an influence to people for the sake of the cross and bring in the message of Christ, you will have in people's minds a certain measure of authority or even uh, sway in their lives, influence in their lives, Okay? You can use that authority or that influence you have in their lives to either build up or to tear down. And that's true of any pastor. We can either use what God has given us as, 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 as leaders in the church to tear people down, or we can use it to build them up. And that's why we ought to be careful how we wield the word of God, because it is often used as a club to beat people down rather than a scalpel that God might take it as a part out of us, those cancers that keep us from being healthy. And Timothy, I want you to recognize this. I want you to know that there is a place that you will have in people's lives, and you can choose to use that one of two ways. And I commend you to walk in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Okay? 
remember earlier when we in uh, First Timothy we talked about the characteristics of a pastor, temperate in all things was one of those things. Look, when those if people swear off against you and they don't want to believe what you have to say, or they don't like that you have stepped on something or put your finger on something in their lives they don't want to deal with, they will oppose you. And nevertheless, be humble about it. Correct them in humility, genuinely in love, that they might ultimately, I like how Paul puts it here, not only God grant them repentance, that they may know the truth, but they might come to their senses. Okay, they might come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, have them captive to do as well. If we love somebody, we're going to seek their very best. That means in humility, if we, if, 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 you know, and as a pastor, I have to do this sometimes, but, but even before I was ever in ministry, you know, there are times when God puts it on your, you know, kind of taps on the shoulder and says, you know what, this is a friend of yours, and this is someone you're close with, and I know it's going to be hard to do this, but I want you to share with them something that I want them to change. And if you've ever had to do that, you know it's really, really, really hard. Because there's always the danger that you're going to hurt them, you're going to crush their feelings, they're going to think that your own motivations might be off. But the truth is, anything that we do that keeps us from walking with the Lord is, as Paul just said, a snare of the devil. It's the kind of thing that keeps us from walking in fullness of relationship with him. And that's why God wants those things to be dealt with. And sometimes he calls us to be his instrument of correction. And if we're going to do that, um, God help us to make sure we do it with humility, genuine humility. And also on top of this, the fact that it's a snare of the devil reminds us that the battles that we face in terms of these things is a spiritual one. It's a spiritual one. This is ultimately what's at stake and what's at play. You know, Paul talks about, you know, in Ephesians 6, 12, the idea here that our, our, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but it's rather, it's again, a very spiritual one. These battles ultimately can either leave carnage or they can provide a springboard to our spiritual growth. Again, verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, patient and willing able to teach, and in humility bringing correction. These are great words for Timothy to hear from Paul. Paul, who is, again, a very, very seasoned minister in the gospel at this point, and he's finding himself coming to the end of his days, and my personal belief is that he, he recognizes this. He knows that at least there's a very strong potential that he's not going to leave this imprisonment alive, ultimately wind in his demise. And so these are the things that he considers important, and I, I, I don't see him hammering these things into Timothy as much as he's sharing them with a real sense of concern and compassion for a young man who's going to carry a lot of weight on his shoulders. But nevertheless, that weight has to be carried, and Timothy has to be ready for it. And so I think there's great value just in knowing that. But of course, my prayer is that not only will we know that intellectually, but we'll find something in all of this that God can begin to employ into our own, uh, bring into our own hearts as well. Because the truth is, the gospel does change things. Timothy's one who's going to be sharing and teaching the word of God, but all of us who know the gospel and have embraced it understand that the gospel changes things, and it changes us. And we need to allow it to. We need to not only have things carved out of our lives that don't belong there, but they also need to be built in. Things need to be built into our lives that make us more like Jesus, that make us more like Christ, that make us uh, the kind of people that others can see Jesus in. You know? And so we hear these things hopefully with an open heart and a desire to let God have his place in our lives that he might change us and make us more like him. Now, if there are any here that don't know the Lord, you know, we spoke very heavily about it that earlier on this morning. You know, it's, it's not enough to simply believe there's a God out there in some sense. You know, there's a spiritual force out there that's responsible for things in the universe. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, John 1, 1 and John 1, 14, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He beheld his glory. He went on the Father in full grace and truth. He stepped into time that we might know God personally. That's the intention of God, that we might know him personally. And if you're here this morning or within the sound of my voice, then this is for you. This is for you to listen to and embrace, not to simply hear it and let it just sort of waft past you. Because one day you will stand before God. You know, it's like the prophet said, prepare to meet your God. That day will come and you'll stand before him. And every day that leads up to it will either be a brick in the wall that will separate you from him or be a brick in the pavement that leads you to him. And that choice is up to you. But know this, nobody ever goes to hell because God didn't think enough of them or care enough about them to keep them from knowing. God loves you too much to let that happen. 
And so here today, as always, I want to give an opportunity for any of you that don't know the Lord to come this morning to confess, to ask him to forgive you, to give you a fresh start. And we've said it many, many times, but it bears repeating. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation, all things pass away. Behold, look and see, check this out. All things become new. That's the promise of God. Not just to resurrect a, uh, you know, uh, not, not just to fix a broken person, but to bring you to be an entirely new one. It's not trying to revive a, an old heart. It's a heart transplant. It's a surgery that makes you new. That's what he's invited you to. But first, there has to be confession. There has to be a recognition of our sinfulness. If we don't know we're sinners, we'll never think we need a Savior. And so we need to understand this. We are sinners, lost, apart from God because of that. But he bridged the gap. He was the answer to Job's prayer. Oh, that there was someone that could mediate between us and put his hand on us both. Jesus is that answer. Matter of fact, that's exactly the picture of the cross of him. One reaching down from heaven to, to, to nail the saints. And so I want to give you an opportunity this morning. As we close in prayer, I'm going to invite you to repeat after me a very simple prayer that allows you just to sort of do business with God, to confess your sin, to ask him to forgive you, to make you new, and to give you the strength to follow him and to walk with him all the days of your life. And remember this, the Bible says, as we read this morning, if we died with him, we will also live with him. So we'll say goodbye to the old self and allow him to make us new. Father, we thank you for this morning and the word that you've given us. We thank you that you're a faithful God, a loving God, but you're also a just God. You are holy. You are pure. Sin cannot just be overlooked and winked at and just sort of brushed aside as if it didn't matter. In fact, it matters so much so that we have to confess it. We have to acknowledge it that we might come to realize that we are, in fact, lost. So, Father, we want to come before you this morning. And some of us have been walking with you for a long time. But nevertheless, we want you to wash our feet, if you would, as it were, that we'd be able to continue to walk with you, free of the dirt and everything that we pick up in the course of our week and our lives, things that weigh us down and keep us from walking with you in fullness and intention. Forgive us, Lord, for anything we've allowed into our lives that ultimately slows us down or weighs us down. Things that don't honor you, but that have somehow found their way into our hearts and our lives and don't reflect you for who you are. I pray you forgive us for that and help us just to continue to walk with you, knowing that, Lord, you are going to be faithful to take us by the hand and lead us through this life. You simply ask us to follow you. For those in this place or who might hear this or watch this later that have never come to Christ in the first place. They don't know what it means to be free and forgiven. All they, they know is that they're in the life that they're in and they may now realize that there is sin that has to be dealt with. They do feel the guilt and shame of things they've done in their lives and they, they don't know what to do about it. I pray they would look to the cross this morning and see Jesus having taken that sin upon himself, not in some generic sense, but knowing them by name and saying, I'm doing this for you. I'm taking your sins away that you might be free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And I pray that God, you would just, by the power of your Holy Spirit, bring the conviction that needs to come. Bring the repentance to the surface that they might not only confess, but turn and save them, that they might be yours. If that's you this morning, you'd like to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior, the one who will be the master of your life, the one who will bridge the gap between here and eternity and lead you home one day to stand before him. And the one who will walk through your life with you even today. And let's come before him together. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I know now that I am a sinner. That I have broken your law. I've hurt other people in my sin. And I've separated myself from you because of it. But I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe that he loves me. And I want to surrender to him. Please forgive me for my sins. And make me clean. I ask you to give me a new start. And the strength to walk with you every day. I trust Jesus now. And I want to walk with him all my days. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
there any in this room who struggle with any of the things we talked about today? I'm praying that God they would find in this place, in this time, this moment, an openness on your part to receive their request for forgiveness. I pray that no one leaves this place feeling condemned or heavy laden because of something they're struggling with, Lord, but rather I pray you bring the strength and power to change them today. I pray that you would help them understand they're accepted in the beloved. Though they struggle, you still love them and your desire is to see them whole. So I praise you, Father, and I ask you just to minister now, even as we close in this final song. Thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you. And again, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have Jason and to come on up and share a closing song with us. Would you all stand with us as well? God bless you to do that this week. If any of you would like to stay for prayer, love to pray with you. Really, really would. So please don't feel you can't do that. The rest of you, I hope you have a great time, uh, fellowship, and a great week together. The Lord bless you. Amen.